The United States and the global status quo are rapidly approaching a breaking point. Viewed from the scale of history, we're milliseconds away. You probably sense this on some level. Perhaps you've pushed the thought out of your mind. Perhaps the implications fill you with fear. Perhaps you're struggling to imagine a positive course of action. Our goal here is to change that. Some won't comprehend what's at stake until it's kicking down the front door. They have their heads in the sand, willfully ignorant. Such humans rarely shape the arc of history, so we won't waste time deconstructing bubbles. Instead, we'll make a bid for the intelligent. In a strong culture, group identity is defined by a national or tribal narrative. Ideas and stories which describe that group, their history, their place in the world. From that narrative, traditions and moral codes accumulate, which reinforce the identity. This is the glue that holds people together. In a dying culture, traditions and moral codes begin to break down. Cultural narratives begin to lose power or become points of division. The United States and its shrinking network of satellites are a dying empire. Its reputation is tarnished. Its position on the geopolitical stage has diminished. Even its financial power has peaked. But most importantly, it has lost all sense of itself. A nation might survive an economic collapse or even a catastrophic war, but mix in an identity crisis and this is a warehouse thousand gasoline just waiting for a spark. Anyone who's been paying attention knows that that spark is already in midair. The death of a national identity leaves an emotional hole. Humans instinctually seek out replacements to fill that hole. Prophets of hate offer replacements. They invite the disillusioned to rally behind stories that make them feel good, assign blame, and impart a sense of belonging, in-group, out-group, defined a trivia. Unless countered by a unifying vision, identity fragmentation accelerates. Left unchecked, this story culminates in territorial conflict or ethnic cleansing. At some point, we will have enough power that we will clear them from the streets forever. That which is degenerate in white countries will be removed. Attempting to predict what comes next would be the wrong psychology. What comes next is up to you. The following message is for those who see the stakes those who would make a conscious bid to shape the arc of history. You see the imperative for intelligent action. Fear is the first enemy. When frightened, our brains work much less efficiently. Rational thought shuts down. Decisions are reduced to fight, flight, or freeze. This phenomenon is even more dangerous in the context of a panicked crowd. Those who maintain calm in the midst of a crisis have the best chance of improving the outcome. Science has shown that deep breathing calms the mind measurably. So make this a discipline. Anytime you feel fear, take a deep breath, reset, bring the world back into focus. Now that we're calm, we can think about our situation, ration. What can we do? What steps could we take right now that would improve the outcome? Not just for ourselves, but for our children and the generations beyond. If you're hearing this message, there is still time. If it resonates, we have a chance. The root of the issue is beyond the political. We have a paradigm problem, a socioeconomic design flaw. A socioeconomic redesign will require a new train of thought, a paradigm for the next generation. Any idea worth holding must be worth testing. Belief must synchronize with logic and evidence, aka reality. The scientific method must be applied. Ideas spread most efficiently when they are simple, compact, and minimally bundled. As such, we're going to break this down into bite-sized pieces, modular components. For more detail, visit paradigmforthenextgeneration.com. Where does your food come from? How far did it travel from the field to your plate? 
how will your family and community feed themselves when the chain of distribution is disrupted? Who will you turn to when the system is down? If your answer is the government, you're gonna have a bad time. You're gonna have a bad time. Rebuilding local resilience is imperative. Change must begin at the community level. We must transition now towards local systems of production, exchange, and decision-making. We must maximize efficiency, reduce inputs, waste, and distance traveled. We must start with small, testable solutions that can be implemented right now without the sanction or assistance of those in power. Some of the skills required for this transition are technical, but the human element is much more important. Those who are able to coordinate their efforts with those around them are able to accomplish exponentially more than those who attempt to go in alone. To rebuild local resilience, we must converge, form coalitions and teams, get our local community involved. This is more difficult than it sounds. It will be in everyone's interest to develop certain skill sets preemptively. Human groups which value conflict resolution and consensus building honor those who master the skills and condemn those who initiate violence, call for wars of aggression, or divide over trivia, have a much better chance of peaceful continuity. The transition towards local resilience and peaceful continuity presents complex challenges. Time and resources are limited. There will be unforeseen obstacles. To increase our chances of success, we must use the adaptive approach. We start by defining local resilience as an abstract goal, and we prioritize local production, exchange, and decision-making with the understanding that this level of cooperation is only possible in the context of peaceful continuity, we can map out a minimal starting point. Psychologically fragmented groups can be unified if the factions share a common goal, a struggle, or an existential threat. We can refer to this instinct as the cooperation principle. Building local resilience, improving social dynamics, and preventing wars of aggression can each serve as unifying goals. The key is to bring people together in the real world. This can start with something as simple as organizing a gathering, passing out flyers, or helping out on each other's land. Working together peacefully builds unity. If psychological unity is attained, identity follows. This variable must not be left to chance. Henry Tajfell's work on intergroup discrimination demonstrated that identity can form around any idea or characteristic that attention is placed on. Even something as arbitrary as a coin toss can be used to divide a room. Within a very short period of time, the groups formed will begin to discriminate against the other side and favor members of their own group. Tajfell referred to this principle as a minimal group paradigm. If identity can form around any idea, then we must work to ensure that the idea is positive, a code which holds us to a high standard of integrity and conduct. These are the kinds of ideas that inspire positive action. Ideas are integrated into identity more easily when they are reinforced by symbols, color associations, or other identity markers. To maximize effect, identity markers should be worn. For example, Americans signal their identity with red, white, and blue. Here's another example. Black to represent an inclusive identity. No dividing over trivia. Black absorbs all color. Green to represent local resilience, pulling together as communities. Yellow to represent peaceful continuity, non-aggression, consensus building, and conflict resolution. Red to represent adaptive action, a scientific method applied. Blue to represent cultural modularity, Meme science, ideas designed to spread. We must define in-group and out-group consciously. Lines of inclusion must be held without compromise. No wars of aggression, no profits of hate. Silence is complicity. Start small, work with what you have. Set realistic goals and take steps to achieve them. The evolution might begin with a gathering of friends or garden in your front yard. A number of you have mentioned that you'd like us to make more videos. I'm going to show you what we're working with here. This is where we live. We're completely off grid. Connecting to the grid isn't really an option at this point. This is our recording setup. A laptop, a USB interface, and an SM58 mic. 
Our electricity comes from these solar panels. We bought this entire system for less than $1,000. In cloudy days, we have to be careful how much we use lights. Electricity is a serious bottleneck. Having only one laptop is also a bottleneck. If you'd like to help us save up towards an upgrade or send us equipment, visit paradigmforthenextgeneration.com forward slash donate. This content is Creative Commons. You have permission to download and distribute it by any and all means. Thank you to each and every one of you who have supported our work by sharing, donating, and volunteering. A single drop can make a ripple. Sometimes a ripple can become a wave.